have two brief questions for Tom and Brad, and then we'll take a few from the audience. So you may not realize, I mean, obviously both of these gentlemen do a lot of work, but their travel schedule is kind of hard to believe. So my first question for both of you is, what do you do on the rare chance that you have to or take time to recharge yourselves? Uh, Tom? Yeah. You start. Okay. Okay, Brad. Um, for me, the, the biggest thing that recharges me is spending time at home with Christy and my, and my, my daughter, uh, I, that, that part a lot. And then if I'm on the road, what I do is uh, I'll either take a walk, but then I go back and order room service and just kind of chill out. <laughs> I'm not the guy who's like staying out until 2 or 3 in the morning and these, you know, everybody's like, wow, you must have done all this stuff in this town. It's like, no, I just do my job and then I go and kind of collect my thoughts and that's what helps me keep sane. Tom. Am I coming through? All right. Um, recharging is basically work for me. And uh, my wife and I have um, kind of this, um, it, it, I mean, frankly, it gets, it gets a little overwhelming. But um, uh, we have this kind of wonderful situation where I can come back with all the adventures that are important to me, not so important to her. And then occasionally, we'll go out on those adventures. The thing that um, is important about the question is that um, I, I'm not sure downtime is the kind of time that recharges me. If that makes sense to you all, I'm just wired. I've always been wired that um, moving time is is what recharges me. I, I actually get real antsy. I've almost I don't know if I get ACD or whatever that um, uh, you know that 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 problem is, but I think I might have that problem <laughs> that I have to keep moving. So. Okay, and then my second question is: If you were not a sculptor or you weren't an architect, what would you be or what would you do? <laughs> well, I went into, I went to school to become a geophysicist uh, because I was interested in sort of the, the physical nature of the world and sort of understanding it. Um, and, you know, I would be, who knows, I, you know, I could be up in Alaska, you know, in the old patch business and um, I don't know. Um, Ultimately, but I was always interested in that that aspect of it. But but the question is um, in the, the aspect of, of understanding the world. But the question is a good one because I I think that would have been a mistake, frankly. And I I, I lucked out, even though I didn't want to do what I'm doing right now. I just can't imagine anything uh, more exciting than what I'm doing right now. What about yeah, you, Brad? My mine, uh, my my passion was basketball and economics, and I thought I was going to be a stockbroker, and then just kind of fell into making things. Um, but I think at some point, if I ever stop doing sculpture, I want to go work for National Geographic. Cool. I think that's, we worked with them a couple of years ago and seeing their explorers in residence and what those people do to help save our earth would just be a, not that I want to go lead it, but to support those people would be an awesome thing to do. Hey, we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please stand up. Raise your hand, and I'll call on you. And we need to keep them brief. Brief questions, brief answers. So any questions? Lee. So the question was, does he get to work with artists, or how does he take into account the uh, owner's art collection? There, um, part of the loop that was missing was, in fact, very much addressing the issues of working with artists on, on projects or working with, with collections. We're basically, probably, if, if I were just to take a wild guess, 50% of our work is working with people that have our collections of some kind. And, uh, and understanding how those artists work. And yes, um, you know, the artist I worked for, his biggest complaint about architects in general is that you, um, you guys come in and you say, this is where the art goes. And Brad was talking about that earlier um, on a project where somebody was giving him a big master plan and saying, well, where should the art go? And I, I definitely have that um, perspective on, on how you engage artists on a commissioned basis because some of them do want to be part of the architecture. It's a personality driven. Some of them do want to be part of the architecture, and I think that's fantastic. Um, but some of them want to be sort of separate and sort of more as, a, as an object in space. Um, I kind of prefer the arc artists that kind of want to really engage in, engage the building because I think there's a there's a sensibility there. Again, it's just like a client brings in their DNA, an artist brings in in their DNA. I think you saw some projects where doors and screens were done by artists. Um, whenever possible, we're going to try to engage those those personalities. Okay. In, Another question. Projects. Stand up, please, if you have one. 
Yes. So I think everybody heard that, but less expensive housing, cluster housing, et cetera. I should have made that clear. A lot of the custom houses are not particularly expensive. I mean, if you, um, the, the commissions that we get almost, almost consistently are, are people that say, this is what I could build a spec house for. What can you do my home for? And there's, and yes, custom is more expensive, but um, there's, a, there's sort of a rule in building and a rule in, in world that if you give me three circles and you put dollar signs, in, dollar signs in one of those circles and quality in the second circle and then uh, quantity, the size in the third circles, you pick two priorities out of those three circles and then let me have more control over the third circle. So uh, if you come in with a dollar amount that you can build and you have a quality, which is typically what I get, that's when the buildings become very small. Now there's some people that don't even have that privilege of being able to come to you, um, although a lot more people could build their own home, just like the mid-century um, homes that were built in the 50s and 60s. They're actually fairly in, um, inexpensive. Um, people have other priorities right now. Uh, they, they might have big RVs or, or lake cabins or whatever. So people are making different maybe decisions that, 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 than what people made in the in my career growing, or my, my life growing up in the mid-century kind of culture. Um, Low-income housing, workforce housing, we're doing a lot of that uh, right now. It gets into prefab, it gets into lower cost sort of manufactured uh, delivery systems. Uh, it's obviously super exciting because so much of that kind of, of architecture, as Ian knows, has really been suffering. It has a lot to do with the underlying developer of those um, projects. Because the bottom line is we operate, we get hired by other people that have the money in the site. So if that developer is a, is a good developer and they come to a good firm like Ian's firm or hopefully our firm and support us in that, I think the architecture just gets consistently better and it's actually kind of a gift back to the community. I hope that kind of makes sense because there's a lot of stuff at the low income workforce housing that's not particularly good. I blame it, of course. There's, there's a bunch of people to blame. There's a bunch, in that case, it's the developer, it's the contractor, it's the architect, it's the group. Buildings are done by groups of people. It's not only one person's fault. Is that kind of making sense? If you get a good group together, believe me, there is some terrific stuff happening um, across the country and in North America that's, that's uh, affordable housing, whatever that means. Yeah, the, uh, the engineering for a, a bad design and the engineering for a good design is very similar. It's a perfect. It's, it's a perfect. It's, you can you can get a good design example. if you do it right and a bad design if you do it wrong, but it costs the same. That's exactly right. Uh, one last question at the back. So again, does the material ever drive the process? No, it doesn't, and that's a really good question because I don't think it ever has. It's 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 always it always starts with sort of this larger sort of conceptual. It's you know, Brad was talking about the narrative, you know, it was like, that's where it all kind of starts. And then you start to sort of figure out, well, what are the appropriate responses? But it's a, it's a really interesting question, because no. I certainly have materials that I've always wanted to work with, but that never drives um, the lead on a, on a project. So I want to thank all of you this afternoon. It's been wonderful. I want to thank Tom, Brad, and Christy. Thank you I want to all. thank Ian, thank you. Lee the Nasher team, Marty and Josie, our sponsors, and all of you for coming. Have a great afternoon. Thanks. Thanks.